So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome our keynote speaker for this morning. Uh, Nancy J. Johnson is the CEO of Facility Matters, um, joining us uh, very kindly from New York City. She's going to be talking about asset management. There are no secrets, only imperfect, imperfect memories. Nancy is a recognized leader of complex multidisciplinary initiatives that have improved the operation and images of the busiest airport system in the U.S., marine terminals and ports, the path rail transit system, bi-state tunnels and bridges, the Port Authority bus terminal, and the World Trade Center. Nancy was the first female maintenance man at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and progressed through the executive levels of aviation, priority capital programs, the downtown restoration program, and the office of the COO. Now Nancy is uh, the president and CEO of Facility Matters, a private consulting firm. Um, please join me in welcoming Nancy to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? It's a wonderful conference, isn't it? It's one of the best I've been to. Okay, so I would like to ask that you keep questions to the end, unless there's something I say that totally baffles you <laughs> and that prevents you from sort of moving forward as, as I move forward, because I'm going to go through this deck um, rather quickly, because I am from New York and we do things a little quickly. Um, so um, please just, you know, sort of make sure I see you if, uh, if there's something that, that you don't understand. Okay. So this morning I'm going to um, talk about how to improve return on investment through asset management. And um, what I mean by there are no secrets and only imperfect memories. Um, and one of the things, and Pat, you're going to start my clicker here, the timer thing, right? Thank you very much. I, I need people to keep me on track. Um, and what I'm uh, hoping to do is show that um, as a member of the asset management organization that you can demonstrate that you bring value to the organization and um, that will help you control your destiny. There's one thing that I guess drives me is I want to make sure my, my destiny is not out of my control entirely. All right, so I'm going to use my clicker to advance this thing and say these are the things I'm going to go over quickly. Um, a brief history of the asset management movement, how we began discussing asset management as a serious contributor to organizational uh, bottom lines. Uh, I'm going to go through a few case studies, international case studies <coughs> that involve public or government organizations as well as private organizations. <coughs> and then I'm going to give you my insights, excuse me, where I think you should focus your energies for the biggest impact and then quickly key takeaways. So to get started, um, the asset management discussion grew in the 1980s over none other than crises. Um, those crises included um, the explosion of the um, Occidental Petroleum's Piper Alpha oil platform in the United Kingdom's North Sea. Um, probably the largest loss of life on an oil platform still to this day. Um, the worldwide crash in oil prices that made uh, companies want to preserve their profit margins, um, diminishing service levels, escalating costs, and poor planning and public infrastructure throughout Australasia, and in the United States, a decline in the um, general condition of the public infrastructure. So what was the worldwide response to this, these crises? And that was efforts um, both individually and um, in groups to try to uh, manage risk and lower costs. In, um, in Occidental, they developed a multidisciplinary team to look at operating and maintenance practices, um, things like lockout tagout procedures so that it would prevent the catastrophe that happened in the North Sea. In um, Australasia, they began to develop asset management standards. In the United States, the federal government began to write regulatory requirements for um, managing the condition of public infrastructure assets, and as a result of that, um, creating um, financial funds through grants to maintain the condition of infrastructure throughout the states and, lo and local levels um, at the condition prescribed by the regulatory requirements. And, um, 
after a few years, uh, actually in 2004, PAS 55 was developed to help uh, optimize the management of assets through a life cycle view. Over the next 20 years, um, discussions about asset management went from fix as fail to asset centric with specific initiatives focusing on asset performance, uh, lower costs, and improving productivity. So fast forward to 2014, and what's the current wisdom? Well, the current wisdom is ISO 55000, which is actually a series, and we heard about um, the individual elements of ISO 55000 in some of the rooms yesterday. Uh, but generally speaking, what ISO 55000 is is a framework or a guideline that acknowledges that asset management is a generator of value, not just a contributor, but a generator of value. And it requires that you focus on 360 degree visibility of that, of that philosophy uh, throughout your organization. It doesn't require that you use any particular methods or procedures in order to implement um, that, that vision, but it does require that you look at six specific areas in order to reach total alignment throughout your organization. So those areas are listed here. They are strategy and planning, which includes policy strategies and objectives, decision making, which is not only on the uh, capital side, but the O&M side and resourcing, uh, life cycle delivery, which is acknowledging that an asset has a full life over which it needs to be cared for and costed, uh, asset information, which is all about data and benchmarking, Organization and people, and that's about changing the culture and probably the most significant item among the six on the, uh, on the list. And then risk and review, and that means making sure you have appropriate contingency plans in place and that you're evaluating um, what's at risk by um, either under or over financing uh, an asset. Uh, one thing I want to mention while I'm on this slide is that um, the way you, you uh, treat an asset results in key performance metrics or um, data and reporting that can utilize both tangible uh, outcomes or intangible outcomes. And we'll, I'll go through those a little further on inside uh, the presentation, but it's important to note that it's not always possible to, um, to use ROI as it was defined. So return on investment is basically the profit you get from your investment. And it's not always easy to evaluate what you get out of an asset based on those dollars and cents. It can be quite complex, and uh, especially if you're talking about intangible assets like um, customer satisfaction or brand recognition. Uh, but I think it's, it's okay to start with things that don't necessarily fit that definition for ROI and eventually move into them as you mature in your knowledge of um, asset management and ISO 55000 uh, principles. I also want to mention that 360 degree visibility is um, very comprehensive in the way it addresses the employee's involvement in asset management. What 360 degree visibility means in terms of ISO 55000 is that every employee in organization understands what asset management means to the organization and where it fits and how it connects to its mission. It understands how their actions fit into that scheme of the asset management mission connection. And it also ensures that there's a common language available throughout the organization, especially for the C-suite and board members, so that they understand when they're making a decision about finances and policy, how it impacts the assets of that organization and the bottom line. All right, so my, um, my tagline here was, there are no secrets and only imperfect memories. And what I mean by that is, if these things that are listed on the screen describe your organization, then your organization is not acknowledging that asset management can contribute to your bottom line. And what happens when that is true is you don't necessarily get the funding you need. You're not getting the support you need to develop the metrics and be able to prove what you can do to manage your assets and improve revenue throughout your organization. And the condition of your assets is probably either questionable, unknown, or failing. 
Um, the types of annual reports and financial statements that come out of these kinds of organizations are ones that report, that have headlines reporting things like, we've maintained or reduced operating costs for the last five years, or with, and without an associated condition assessment for assets, or productivity measure, or efficiency statements. Um, another, another type of um, indicator of an organization that is in this sort of realm is when they say things like, we've been able to maintain headcount um, at stable levels for 10 years. And again, without um, showing an appropriate um, metric about the condition of their assets, their efficiency, or their productivity. So I'm going to go through a few case studies. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly and then try to get to um, the things that I think offer you the biggest impact, because I think that people in an asset management organization are largely in control of their destiny. But I think they need to focus on strategy. As much as tactics are lots of fun, and I came from an operating environment, so that's what I like to do, strategy is really, really important because you want the people in the C-suite to hear you, you want them to support you, and you want to be able to deliver to them things that they want to hear. Okay. So first, um, let me also say that none of these case studies was done in within one year. These are all multi-year efforts. ISO 55000 or PAS 55, if that's what you like to use, uh, is a multi-year effort and it takes time and it takes energy in order to implement it. So you have to, you know, consciously select to go through these processes and then, um, and then stick with it for the long term. All right, so the, my first case study here is the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and their efforts to um, make asset management a mission critical um, idea throughout the organization. So Pennsylvania, as a US state, ranks among the top 10 states in the United States for state-owned roadways, interstate highways, bridges, railroads, and freight. They started their strategic asset management journey before asset management policies like PS 55,000 and ISO 50, uh, PS 55, excuse me, and ISO 55,000 were even a dream. They started this effort in the 1990s. And you may wonder why am I bringing this up then? And I'm telling you that, you know, ISO 55,000 and even PS 55, they're not rocket science. Why I'm showing you the PennDOT um, case study is because they got it right. Um, long before any of those standards existed. So what did they do? They looked at asset management strategically, and they established action-oriented enterprise-wide goals to improve bottom-line business results. They based those results that they desired on customer, stakeholder, and partner input. They incorporated best and world-class practices. They aligned their business plans with their strategic agenda. They managed those plans with performance measures that made a difference, that drove behavior throughout their organization, and that are used in evaluation and decision making. Their strategic commitments were to utilize life cycle criteria for asset management, to reduce outstanding or deferred maintenance, and to manage performance through a hierarchy of scorecards that were appropriate to the level of staff that would be seeing them and needing to use them for their, um, to carry out their roles and responsibilities. And they committed to continuous improvement. So I'm gonna show you um, a very low level, simple metric and just follow it through to show you what results they got out of this. So this was their earliest plan back in, I'm gonna say 1999. Their strategic focus area was Maintenance to put maintenance first, so to uh, ensure that deferred maintenance did not become overwhelming. Their high-level goal was to have smoother roads, and their strategic objective was to improve the ride quality for um, consumers. So what they did was they selected a uh, worldwide benchmark, and I know you guys aren't necessarily 
infrastructure oriented. So I will describe these things as best I can so that you can um, take away something for your industry. Um, but the uh, worldwide standard that they selected was called the International Roughness Index. It has a scale um, that relates to an easy to understand description for smoothness, so smoothness, lack of roughness, and it's measured using a tool that's basically a vehicle that monitors the depth of ruts in pavement and the resulting um, jostle to the vehicle or lack thereof. Less jostle, of course, smoother the ride. Um, and when you look at the chart that shows the IRI medians for Pennsylvania, which is PA, and the United States as a whole, um, the lower the number or the lower the uh, area on the graph, the smoother the road is. So what Pennsylvania found out after using the IRI to uh, measure their roadway smoothness was that they were worse than the United States as a whole. Um, so they realized that they couldn't look at all their roads at the same time because it would have been too overwhelming and it would have not resulted in success. So they selected a subset of the roads and the subset that they selected was the interstate highways because it made the biggest impact on their ultimate mission. Um, their ultimate mission being throughput of moving uh, freight for economic viability and consumers in terms of commuting. So focusing only on those interstate roadways, they set targets, two um, interim or near-term targets, one for 2002 to reach an IRI of 104 and one for 2005 to reach an IRI of 99. They started with an IRI of 108. And just to go back, so 108 is still considered smooth, um, but what DOT, PennDOT uh, did was they said, okay, that might be smooth, but for our consumers, we want to do better. So they imposed over that their own internal standards, and they decided that over the long term, they wanted to keep their smoothness at an IRI of 100 or less. So uh, fast forward a few years, and what did they do? Now this chart, I apologize, it only shows 2008 to 2013, but I can tell you that in the year 2000, when they had a an actual IRI of 108 and a goal for 104, they actually um, achieved, I'm sorry, so in year 2000, they had an IRI of 108. In year 2002, their goal was 104, and they actually achieved an IRI of 89, so significantly below their goal. Um, and also in keeping with their long-term goal of being under 100 um, for the out years. And then in years 2008 and beyond, they achieved an IRI of 90, still below 100, so they're still meeting their goals. So here's when I say, this is a return on their investment. Their investment may not have been profit, but their investment was their energy and their time and their focus to that business strategy of creating higher customer satisfaction through smoother roads um, so that they could encourage more people to use their highways and probably pay more tolls and have more freight throughput, um, and all that good stuff. So their ROI for roughness and their improvement was 17%. All right, so just back to those six areas um, to achieve total alignment from ISO 55,000. I think uh, based on what I've shown you in the, in the charts, and you can go back and look at them when you get your USB port, um, they touched on every single one of those areas long before ISO 55000 was put in place. So what was next for Penn DOT? Uh, Penn DOT uh, Pennsylvania is one of 16 states in the eastern United States that comprise a critical freight movement region known as the I-95 corridor. The I-95 corridor generates 41% of United States gross domestic product and the region represents 40% of the U.S. population. So their next strategic goal, using ISO 55000 principles, even though they might not call them that, is to um, improve um, freight planning throughout the I-95 corridor, which involves um, multiple states, multiple political jurisdictions, and multiple transportation modes in order to optimize that I-95 network so that they can achieve more reliable freight flows 
and a better commitment, uh, better commute time for end users. All right, so moving on to the next one, we're gonna talk about airports for a minute here, and we're gonna talk about Gatwick. So Gatwick is the second largest um, airport in the UK, uh, both in real estate and in operations. But their goal is to be number one. So what they did was they used a, um, a top-down approach. Um, and again, this is a private organization under contract that um, earns revenue, uh, earns a profit for running the airport. So they uh, established a business strategy and they started out by using uh, PASS 55 uh, templates and then converted to ISO 55000 um, as that information became available. But they set a business strategy to grow and become London's airport of choice. Um, their first objective, which is really important, was to optimize airport assets. So right away, you see that asset management is, is tops on their uh, mission critical list. So they have um, a little bit of a, to me, this is the boring part of, uh, of uh, making asset management important in an organization. They have quite an elaborate uh, strategy, uh, policy, and objective structure. So they, they have uh, first their mission to be number one, then they have these six strategic priorities um, that they use to guide uh, the development of business plans and asset management policies and plans all the way down to the employee level. I'll show you how that works. Uh, but first I wanna talk about that line of sight issue because it is again probably the most important area for, for you to focus on in an organization and um, in keeping with ISO 55000 principle, not to require any particular method of implementation, Gatwick found that, excuse me, the um, Hoshi Conry method of uh, policy deployment worked well for them. So in saying this, I probably didn't say this earlier, but if you think Six Sigma works for you, or you think management by objectives works for you, or lean manufacturing, they can all be used within the structure or framework of the ISO 55000 policy. So they, at Gatwick, they used Hoshi, Hoshin Conry, I can say that, um, method for policy deployment in order to um, give them 360 degree line of sight. So it is a um, sort of a concurrent top down, bottom up method for getting every employee in an organization to focus on the end goal at the same time. So that there's no confusion, there's no rework, there's no um, dual discussion going on about what the uh, objective is. And this is used to drive results. So now just to look at um, how they develop things and to show you that asset management planning is, um, is embedded in their strategic structure. You can see that, again, the mission to be number one is on top, then they have those six strategic priorities, and then leading down from those six strategic priorities is the development of the business plan and that cycle on the left, and the development of their asset management policy and their asset management plans on the right. Um, there are connectors in the middle to make sure that everything is happening parallel and, and consistent with one another, and then they meet in the middle with asset management plans that incorporate asset life cycle management, and those are all developed by asset group. So it just sort of demonstrates a level of employee specialization in the airport industry. So what um, Gatwick did in terms of their employee focus, um, they gave their asset management staff um, a significant amount of support, including computer-based training, not only on um, ISO 55000, but also Gatwick's commitment to asset management and how the, the commitment to asset management from a corporate level and ISO 55000 work together. They gave them pocket guides on print and available on their smartphone in terms of uh, describing how those things work together. They provided one-on-one -on -one mentoring and guidance. They developed one-page resource documents that were asset-specific, and they um, ensured that all employees, both at an individual and a team level, 
had objectives with line of sight to Gatwick's six strategic priorities and their strategic asset management objectives. And then at the organizational level, they have a formal uh, performance appraisal process and they conduct these performance reviews for each individual and team every six months. So what were their results? They improved their shuttle train availability uh, from 85% to 99%. And as a private organization that had service level targets, that gave them additional revenue. And they experienced 31% uh, savings in operating expenses for loading bridges because of a change management program for better monitoring um, and maintenance. Okay, so did Gatwick um, demonstrate the use of the six required ISO 55,000 categories? I think so. I think I should give them credit for risk and review because they probably wouldn't have chosen those loading bridges and, um, and the, uh, um, the uh, shuttle train uh, availability had they not conducted a risk review and ensured that they could uh, reach success through it. But I just couldn't find evidence that said they, they made those conscious choices as opposed to, yeah, what we get at the end of the, the review cycle? Oh, yeah, we, you know, we improved shuttle train availability and, uh, and uh, lowered the costs on, uh, on the loading bridge maintenance. So let's attribute it to that. So, but I, I think it's pretty clear that, that they took a comprehensive review and applied those principles uh, pretty, pretty straightforwardly. Okay, now last, and this is my favorite, this is Europort's. Um, what's, what made this my favorite is that Europort's is actually owned by a consortium of financial institutions. So I wouldn't typically think that financial institutions would think about improving the bottom line through asset management as a first choice, but they did. They took a top-down approach, and like um, Gatwick, they started with a PAS 55 uh, uh, template, and then they converted to ISO 55000 when it came out. Um, now, this was a rather large organization. Um, had 26 port, as in, these are maritime ports, so 26 port terminals um, throughout Europe and China. And, um, and so they had cultural issues as well that they had to uh, deal with in terms of ensuring people understood their mission. So they had a two-phased approach here to their asset management strategy. Um, in their first phase, they positioned asset management as a new business philosophy to improve performance across the organization. Um, they gave staff the, the, the knowledge and methods and tools they needed to improve performance, and they wanted to improve cultural cohesion and in, increase the accuracy of capital spending forecasts so that they, they leveled spending, so they were um, neither going to be spending more than they were given nor less, and both are problems because both indicate something's awry in the management of that organization. So what they did in that phase one, even though they wanted to change things throughout the organization, they focused small. They focused on 11, which was less than half of all their ports across four countries. And they implemented um, something that's identified in ISO 55000 as asset management planning. So it looks at the entire life cycle of asset management and um, it, what was required by the ports in order to complete these asset management plans uh, were up-to-date asset inventories or registers, market demand forecasts, service level commitments, risk ass assessments, life cycle management plans, and a 20-year plan for capital expenditures. Now this was brand new to the port staff, and each of the ports had to develop their own registers, their own plans individually. This was part of the engineering organization's responsibility, and the engineering organization had to deliver all of this information to their local port executive, so their C-suite person at the local level, and then that local executive had to deliver a presentation on what they, what they accomplished to their corporate people. So it ensured that uh, people throughout the organization understood uh, what the results of this program um, were. So what was the result of phase one? 
first I want to tell you that it took only 18 months, which I think is pretty fantastic. Um, but um, within that 18 months, what they did was they gained a comprehensive view of the asset portfolio across ports that wasn't previously available. And they were given the information to leverage purchasing and leasing power across the business units. So they gained economies of scale by, um, by acquiring that knowledge and being able to make um, further reaching purchasing and leasing decisions. All right, so they, they accomplished really great stuff in that phase one, so they decided to go to phase two. What did they do in phase two? They expanded the asset management planning from those 11 ports that they started with to tw all 26 ports, and it included the delivery of a risk-based structure for the evaluation and prioritization of assets. So what they did was they developed a single comprehensive database of assets using consistent criteria and a plan for increasing return on investment, extending life, and reducing capital demands. So the risk structure, um, risk, I think as we talked about yesterday in the panel a little bit, risk is kind of a complex thing to collect information on. Um, but when the way they approached it was they based their risk structure on the condition of assets, the criticality of those assets to the delivery of services, and the difficulty of restoring those assets should they fail. And then they also tr attempted to manage their success by focusing on six asset classes. So at a port, I think these are almost all of the asset classes, they focused on the cranes, product movement facilities, mobile equipment, building and other infrastructure, production assets, and support assets. So what did they achieve? And th this took a few years. Um, this took them to about a, a five-year uh, investment. What they achieved in phase two was they were able to identify opportunities for adding value at both the ca capital and the operating level. Capital expenditures were leveled so that they were approximately 37% lower and focused on performance and operating expense outcomes and without increased risk to the business. And they accomplished the 360 degree line of sight for management to understand the technical realities of the operations. So that's the top down and for the bottom up, the technical and operations staff to understand the impact of these activities on the business. So did Euroports utilize those six ISO 55,000 categories? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I think they did a fantastic job and um, I, uh, by far I found that there was, that theirs was the best example of an ISO 55,000 implementation. So what does this mean to us? Well, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, uh, by showing you these case studies, is that, again, it's not rocket science. I think that even if you're operating within an asset management organization that is far removed from the corporate structure of your, um, of your uh, company, that you can create a movement to influence the, um, the organization to acknowledge asset management as that generator of value. But again, I say it's a multi-year effort and you have to really have some intestinal fortitude in order to approach it, but it's not impossible. Um, it's a commitment to continuous improvement, even if you're only looking at improving against yourself internally. So these are my recommended approaches for, uh, for ensuring success and for continuing to move forward rather than having to take some back steps, because I'm sure we've all approached things that, that uh, made us take back steps from time to time. Um, I also think that these approaches will ensure that um, organizational memories of failures and the causes of failures will be institutionalized in a way that they won't be forgotten and there won't be blame placed because of lack of uh, documentation and evidence about what happened. Um, and, I, and I think that's equally important uh, for us to feel like we're doing a good job. Uh, the fact that we can show that cause and effect. All right, so first, and you've seen this chart so often, you've probably embedded it into your memory, but you're gonna align 
um, asset management within the organization by addressing all six of these categories, even if you're only in the asset management organization and it is far removed from the corporate structure or the C-suite. I suggest that you focus your energies for alignment on these particular things. So I would take the time to uh, apply research to selecting the best value proposition for express expressing return on investment, whether it's profit oriented or whether it's service oriented or something else, as long as it is important to the people that you're talking to and valued by them. You want to um, establish KPIs that support your strategic business plan for the uh, company. So you have to make sure that connection is taking place. And you want to commit to plan, do, check, act. And I know we've talked about that a little bit. Um, I'll go through it briefly in one of my slides. But, but it's a way to consistently apply change to an organization and test the change um, to make sure it's, it's what you're doing is consistent and reliable. You know, it's like the scientific approach. You want to make sure that everything you're doing can be pinpointed, pinpointed back to one change at a time. Go through the cycle and then make one change again. Okay, so I'm throwing out some value propositions here to select return on investment um, metrics for. They can be tangible. Uh, like lowering costs or lengthening life. They can be intangible, like improving public confidence, customer loyalty, or brand recognition. Um, and then, um, and, and those tangible and intangible ones are, of course, the most common ones that you can find. But then these three others are, um, depending on your industry, very important. Um, and I'm going to go through those individually. So regulatory requirements. I happen to be a fan of regulatory requirements. So I guess that makes me a regulatory geek. Um, but I'm a fan of it because it protects us at so many levels. It protects us as consumers. It protects us as corporate people. And it protects us if we're in the government. It sets down a wisdom. And if you follow that wisdom, um, you're sort of following what is the most current class of information that's available, assuming that those regulatory requirements are being updated uh, appropriately. Um, so how compliant you are with regulatory compliance can actually um, be important for your, um, not only for your uh, corporate structure, um, but also for your performance in the, in the public sector and to your consumers. You can go even further by saying, do I meet, just meet regulatory requirements, or am I exceeding them? Or in fact, am I using best practices or world-class practices? So it, it sort of implies you can go up to regulatory requirements and meet them, or you can go way beyond and go to something that's, that's more up-to-date, more world-class that other people have used. But I, I just... Um, caution you, make sure things are proven before you use them, otherwise you're out there on your own. So um, think long and hard about doing something like that on your own. Um, the next one is grant funding. That's really important in the United States because um, the federal government has acknowledged with its regulatory requirements that it can't do everything by itself. We, as big as government tends to get over time, it's still never big enough to take care of all of its responsibilities. So one of the things it does is it makes taxpayer money available to uh, local authorities, state and local authorities, to make the improvements that are needed. Now, grant funding is available for um, standard upgrades to infrastructure, as well as for repairs in, um, in the aftermath of an emergency or a disaster like, uh, like Hurricane Sandy that we experienced just a few years ago. And grant funding increases the amount of money, free money, that's available to your organization. Now, it is, it is free. It, the only catch there is that you have to be compliant with the regulatory requirements. And as the regulatory requirements have evolved, they have incorporated things that are, that are critical to asset management, like having an asset registry or inventory, assessing the condition of your assets periodically, having key performance metrics, and being able to associate market value and funding um, that's appropriate to the asset at any particular point in time. And asset condition, I mean, I don't think I need to tell you guys how important asset condition is, but it is a, a very 
powerful um, expression of value and return on investment, especially if you're improving that condition or performance. Um, KPIs are, again, this is pretty common knowledge. They're input, output, activity, and outcome. Outcome are really the ones that you want to get to. They're a little more complex, but they're the ones that, that really show some important bottom line improvement. You always want to select a wide variety of KPIs but because it tells people about your business in a more holistic way. So these KPIs uh, were provided to me courtesy of uh, CH2M, one of the consulting firms that I've worked with in the past. Um, Highways England has a, a rather broad inventory of uh, pavement and um, non-pavement infrastructure, including bridges and um, drains and softscape, which I believe is landscaping. Um, so they are in the process of approaching ISO 55000 standards uh, using a systematic approach, and they've hired CH2M in order to help them with that. But you can clearly see that they've connected their organizational strategies to KPIs that are meaningful to their customers or their constituents. Um, they're based on safety, they're based on um, smoothness of roadways, um, they're based on um, environmental improvements, among other things. So um, this is just a, a more current example of activities that have been taking place over the last year in the UK. All right, here's Plan, Do, uh, Check, Act. And again, I'm sure you've seen it before. What it does is it improves the reliability and the consistency of changes that you want to make. So after you define your plan, which is in the upper left-hand corner, you're going to execute it. You're going to measure and analyze um, the results. And then you're going to look at whether the results got you where you wanted to be. And if they didn't, what was the cause and effect? Um, and then you're going to change one thing one thing and then you that's the improved control and then you're going to start through that cycle again and it may sound like a slow process but it's really important to be able to use a scientific approach to the changes you make so that you can be uh, assured that you're pointing to the right cause and effect of those changes okay you want to get people involved this is this is the most important plus probably the easiest thing you can do you need to chat people up you need to talk to people inside your team, outside your team, and in the C-suite. Um, when you're approaching the C-suite, though, you have to have very um, refined metrics and reports in order to ensure that you're giving them something that they understand and that's meaningful to them based on their position in the organization. So you have to reach people. And your mantra in reaching people should always be, why should they care? The way you get people involved, as I said, is by chatting them up throughout the organization, every opportunity you, you can get. And just think about that you know, cycle of who, what, where, how, why. You know, why should they care? Who does what? What will happen if? Um, where can you help? Um, and how can you make things better? Um, and uh, meaningful reports um, are going to be your best friends. And this is another difficult thing, but it, it it's important to apply your energy to this. So I'm going to show you a series of, of reports that have been effective in public infrastructure, and I, I hope you'll see why. <laughs> okay, so this is the first one. Now, pavement condition is probably um, one of the asset management areas that has been um, measured, tested, um, and reported on um, ad infinitum. So the pavement condition index that I'm showing you, this is standardly available. Many organizations, many associations use a similar um, chart to express pavement condition. What this says is, um, so on the x-axis, we're talking about the age of pavement in years. On the y-axis, we're talking about pavement condition. And pavement condition goes anywhere from failed at the zero point on the y-axis up to excellent um, when it is brand new. So if you follow that uh, red line down from the y-axis to the x-axis, you'll see that between a condition of excellent and fair, if a rehabilitation is needed for pavement, it will cost you $2 per unit at that condition. If you allow the condition of the pavement to fall to somewhere between poor and good, you know,
know, I don't think I have the clicker with the, uh, with the pointer on it, so I'm hoping you're following me here. But I'm looking right in the middle at that $4 for reactive maintenance here. Um, if your pavement condition falls between poor and good, you're paying twice as much as you were when the pavement condition was better. If you allow the condition of your pavement to fall to between poor and failed, it's going to cost you about six times per unit to rehab that pavement as it did when it was in the good range. So how do you put that into practice? Well, this is an actual chart that used a red light, green light uh, approach to sell to their board um, a selection criteria for rehabilitating pavements. Um, so it's important not only that you take charts that are, have been found useful throughout your industry or at other facilities that apply to your business, but that you import your own data for it. So what this particular pavement intensive agency in the New York, New Jersey area found was that their pavement could be rehabbed for $1 per unit when that condition of that pavement was in the fair range or about 70 PCI, which is pavement condition index of 70. It would rise to $1.36 for rehab when it got at the low end of fair, and it would almost more than double uh, when you got to poor and then be five to six times as expensive when you got below poor. This one chart reduced the conversation at the board level to, okay, what condition do we want to keep our pavement at? We want to keep it at fair to good so that it minimizes our costs. And so what it did for the, the board was it sort of gave them the justification they needed to approve these expenses every time they came up, and it reduced the conversation so that they could move on to other asset management things. And that's what you want to do. You want to get that conversation to the point where people have enough information to approve things and then move on to the next thing because it, it becomes routine, you become smarter for it, and, um, and then you can move on. Okay. Um, here's another um, important um, indicator that can be used with reports, facility condition index. Um, this is basically the value of deferred maintenance over the current replacement value of a facility. And this chart is um, it's a little complicated, but it's an important chart that does the same thing as that pavement inde uh, condition index chart does. So again, on the y-axis, we have years that go out to about 2031. On the left axis, we have dollars for deferred maintenance. The background colors are the condition that a facility could be in based on the value of the deferred maintenance. The green bar at the bottom represents 5% of the market value of the, um, of the asset, and this happens to be a bus terminal asset in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, that 5% marker was a federal standard that was based on research at federal buildings that indicated that a maintenance budget um, should always be 5% of a, uh, the market value in order to maintain it in a good condition. The other condition levels based on deferred maintenance are based on um, infrastructure maintenance um, data from Canada and the United States, uh, mostly public but some private infrastructure. So again, this reduces the conversation to what condition do we want to maintain our assets in and what funding is required for that asset. And then it's up to the asset management guys, once they get that funding approved, to maintain the asset at the level that they said that it could be. Um, the lines just show different funding levels based on the current condition of that particular uh, bus terminal asset. This is also an interesting one. I, I just show this for illustrating, uh, illustrative purposes. Um, this was uh, a federal study um, that was conducted by the Government Accountability Office, which, is, um, which conducts studies at the request of Congress to make sure that uh, we're spending public funds wisely. Um, since risk is typically uh, a very difficult metric to show, I'm showing you this so that you uh, can see that you don't have to use quantitative information in order to express that um, there may be a better way to do things than the way we're doing things today. Uh, so what this shows is um, 
um, U.S. Navy shipbuilding practices compared to commercial shipbuilding practices and the extra risk borne by the U.S. Navy. Um, the cones, um, so the outer cone, the grayish cone, is the Navy risk cone and the inner cone is the commercial shipbuilding risk cone. And down along the x-axis, you have uh, project management milestones that the uh, Navy experiences um, at their detriment that result in persistent cost growth and schedule delays and uncertain outcomes compared to commercial um, shipbuilding. So what the Navy does here is when they initiate a project, um, they don't have all their risk managed before they sign a contract because they don't really know what they want. They know they want better technology and they know they want something better than they used to have, but they don't figure that out before the contract is signed. They sort of allow that to be very fuzzy and they hope that the contractor is going to help uh, figure that out. Um, and when you get to construction, they still haven't figured out all those uh, risk issues. So the Navy, as a result, uh, bears extra risk that the shipbuilding industry does not because they mitigate everything and put everything in a performance-based contract before they start building. And that their contract in the commercial industry, shipbuilding industry, is their Bible. Okay. Um, lastly, um, I, I say you focus your limited resources for maximum results, and technology is there to help you. It's your friend. It enables you to do what you want to do, which is the tactical stuff and maybe some of the strategic stuff. So what technology will do is it removes those routine and time-consuming activities from staff that allow staff to focus on um, the things that require their individual expertise. And the example I'm going to give you here, whether, whether you choose technologies like building management systems or diagnostic tools with, uh, with uh, advanced technologies um, or BIM, which is building information modeling, all these things can help you. But BIM is the latest technology that is being put to use in the United States, both to improve construction and operation and maintenance. And I'm going to show you why. And this is just a chart to show you. I think we've all been there. All those as-built in a room on the left um, can be consolidated into one very complex, multi-layered CAD drawing with lots of data and asset registers in it, and it will make your life a dream. Um, BIM delivers uh, an organized and an accurate model of both designs for construction and built facilities. Um, immediate benefits for construction uh, have shown 10% um, savings of contract value through clash detection. So in other words, making sure that you know where things are and you don't try to build things where other things are um, so that you have to remove things before you can build something new and uh, up to 7% reduction in project time. So for every 16 months of construction, that means you're taking one month off of uh, the schedule. And BIM requires that uh, buildings uh, be LEED certified. So LEED provides you competitive advantage and increased market value for uh, your finished project. And as I said, BIM also produces net O&M savings. Um, both those constru construction savings uh, statistics and the O&M savings statistics are the result of um, a project that was done at the Stanford University Medical Center um, just a few years ago. And um, so this information is courtesy of them. Um, what they showed for O&M savings, uh, by knowing where things are and being able to plan for replacement parts, in advance, they save more than 5% of their O&M costs on an annual basis. Finally, key takeaways, fixed assets have inherent organizational value. They impact organizational performance and they influence organizational risk. They are therefore generators of ROI. So that's my, that's my proof statement. Um, ISO 55000 gives you a guideline or a framework for managing assets in a way that assures performance is both consistent and sustainable. It allows you to use preferred methods for implementation, and it works for any industry or asset. To improve ROI through asset management, you want to focus on that 360-degree line of sight, foster an environment of open communication and results-oriented performance, seek consistency and reliability through that plan, do, check, act cycle and commit to continuous or relentless improvement because it really is a, a continuous cycle that can feel relentless. <laughs> um, 
If you want to accurately account for your assets across their entire life cycle and use metrics as a tool. They're not the answer, but they're a really good tool. And last, start small and finish big. Align your asset management within the organization, get people involved, and focus your limited resources for uh, maximum results. Finally, I want to just thank um, three organizations that I've done business with and who provided slides for me and some input that I, I could bring to you. They are CH2M, Hagerty Consulting, and Microdesk. And I want to thank you for being such uh, nice listeners. So thank you.